Gospel that's recorded by St. Luke chapter number 16 and I want to lift up verses 19 through 29 in your hearing from Luke chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible with you it's cool because we're right here on the screen. It says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that after the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, unfortunately, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then verse number 24 says to us, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Verse 26, he says, and besides, it's very powerful, all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And final verse number 29, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Can we all say amen? Amen. I, I want to preach for just a couple of moments today. I want to talk uh, from this thought and, and be sure to take note if, if you're doing so. I want to talk about what hell can teach you. What hell can teach you. Since y'all are um, not that old yet, I'm not going to ask you to repeat that to your neighbor. I want to talk about what, what, hell, what hell can teach you. The passage is unique in its own right, particularly in 21st century, because it focuses its attention around the idea, around the concept of that which is unpopular in this current generation. Uh, no doubt somebody who is tuned in physically or perhaps tuned in uh, via the internet is already tuning this message off and out because hell is not a popular subject. The current flow of this generation does not even hear messages about the literal hell. In fact, some people do not even believe in such a place. But I will point out to you that if you believe in heaven, you might also believe in hell. Because there is a yin and a yang. There is a night and a day. Uh, there is an opposite. There's good, there is evil. There is light, there is darkness. There's a sun and there's a moon. There's a male, there's a female. There's an opposite to everything that exists. Uh, one preacher said, except for God. There's no opposite to God because there is nothing to whom you can compare him. And I, I like that. But it's not really popular because it deals with the idea of something that people have a fear of. And when people have a fear of a thing, they have a hatred for a thing. And when people have a fear and a hatred of a thing, they don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. When people have fear and hatred of certain animals, they don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. Some people can't even stand for people to talk about it. 
Some people, if you just mention the word snake, they can't handle it. They, they don't even want to think about it or a rat or some people don't like dogs or, or cats or whatever the case may be. Uh, there are even people who can't stand fish. You know, they have fear of, of, of fish. Just so many different things that they just uh, have a, a tendency to fear and to hate. And therefore, they don't want to have any dealings or associated, uh, associations with it. And hell is like that as well because people don't relish the thought of being in a place of torment, a place of fire, a place of brimstone. And it's definitely not popular to preach. Well, lucky for me, that's what I like. That's what I like because I'm not interested in being popular. I'm not a slave to response. And so I'll take the task of talking today about hell. But before we deal with the experience of hell, there's the prelude because the story opens up by Jesus giving us this random story, but it is a relevant and revenant story of a rich man and a poor man, and both of them end up dying. The rich man who has lived his life, who has fared sumptuously every single day, to fare sumptuously every day, which literally means that he lived a lavish lifestyle. He had it going on. He ate well every day. I mean, just every single day. Full breakfast, full lunch, full dinner. I ain't talking about cereal for breakfast. I'm not talking about a cheese sandwich for lunch. I'm not talking about a bag of chips for dinner. No, he ate four course meals all the time. I'm talking about the kind of lifestyle that that if you mentioned the word baloney, he would look down on baloney. What do you mean? He was that kind of rich. I mean, he had it going on, the, the kind of lifestyle that uh, he would drive, the kind of car that if your car wasn't made by a certain label or a certain model, he'd look at you and say, is that a, that's not a Mercedes. We, we, that one's not welcome here. He was that kind of lifestyle liver, fared sumptuously every single day. And when he died, he ends up in hell. On the flip side, he is a poor beggar who laid at his gate daily. And he was only desiring for the crumbs that fell from the table. This is interesting because this is basically what the dogs would do. While the master was eating, they would simply sit there at the end of the table. And whatever fell from the master's table, if you can remember the woman who said to Jesus, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He wouldn't even give this man the crumbs that fell from the table. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. In essence, when the dogs could eat the food that fell from the master's table, the dogs felt so sorry for the man that instead of eating the food, the crumbs that fell from the table, they went over to lick his sores. It's bad when dogs have more compassion than people. Help me, Holy Ghost. And so it is that he dies, but he ends up in what we would consider likened unto a heavenly state, which the Bible refers to as Abraham's bosom. Now, let me clear up something, lest I lead you astray and uh, I be found guilty of not clarifying and giving you closure. The rich man does not go to hell because he's rich. And the poor man does not end up in Abraham's bosom because he is poor. Because the truth of the matter is, it is not a sin to be rich. It is not a sin to be rich as much as it is not holy to be poor. Uh, some people think that the less you have, the more spiritual you are. And the more you have, the less spiritual you are. But nothing could be further from the truth. If rich people were not able to enter into his kingdom, then how can Abraham be mentioned in this passage? Because Abraham, who happens to be, by the way, the father of the faith, or the father of the faithful, was a rich man. The Bible said that Job was a perfect and upright man, one who loved God and avoided or eschewed evil, and there was no man like him anywhere around. He was the richest man amongst the men in that particular area. So it is not a sin to be rich as much as it is not holy to be poor. Some people say, well, money won't make you happy. Well, being broke won't either. Can I get a witness from three people that's ever been broke? 
Can you testify that being broke don't make me happy? I, I done had some money and I done not had some money. And I felt better when I had some than I did when I had none. I just let the truth be told. And so he didn't go to hell because he was rich and he didn't go to heaven because he was poor. As a matter of fact, that kind of stuff don't get you into heaven anyway. And I, I have to keep reiterating this message because I think that, that we have thwarted the reality, the truth uh, theologically of what gets us into heaven. Your works don't get you into heaven. I keep trying to remind us of that, that uh, according to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, he says, by grace are you saved through faith and it is not of works lest any man should boast. God has created salvation in such a way that none of us can actually stand before God and brag about what we've done, which is why I can't stand critical and judgmental people in church. Because when we look at other people's lives and we point out their issues and their flaws, the problem is we can forget what we did, but we can always memorize what other people did. And if the truth be told, a lot of people that we point our finger at, we are guilty of the same things they've done. We just had selective amnesia and forgot we did the same thing too. We'll point the finger at someone and the problem is that many of us, the God that we worship is the God of our opinion. The God that we worship, that was good, is the God of our concept, which is why the God that you serve can forgive you of what you did, but can't forgive that brother for what they did. I don't understand how God can forgive somebody who did this. So, yeah, your God can forgive you of your immorality, but he can't forgive the murderer who is on death row. See, the truth of the matter is the God that God really is can forgive what you did and can forgive what they did. Because just when you point the finger and say, I ain't never killed nobody, the Bible says that if you're angry with your brother without a cause, it's just like you killed somebody because you killed the relationship so in God's eyes he sees it as that which is an equivalent and so it is that uh, the question becomes on what grounds do we get to stand before God and say that I qualify for heaven if any of us could say that we qualify for heaven, then we lying and the truth ain't in us. The only way you able to get into heaven is Jesus got to come by, grab you by your hand and walk you in the door. Because if you don't walk in with him and Jesus say, God, they with me, how many know you ain't going in there? I don't care how much tithe and offering you pay. I don't care how many scriptures you memorized or how many times you attend Bible study or how many times you come to church on Sunday morning. You can sing all them songs the choir be singing and record all them scriptures that the preacher be calling out, but none of that qualifies you to get into heaven. I'm glad you don't drink no more, you don't smoke no more, you don't twerk no more, you don't talk about people no more, but that still ain't good enough to get you in the gate. The only thing that gets you in the gate is Jesus got to come by, grab you by your hand, and escort you through the door. Otherwise, you ain't getting in. You can wear a big medallion around your neck, a big cross around your neck, and have one of them big old Bibles that your grandma and them used to have on the table. You can have that on the one arm, and you can have your rosary around your neck, and, and you can have one of your preacher towers in your right hand, and think you're going to walk into heaven, and he's going look at you and say uh-uh access denied but you can get rid of all of that Jesus come grab you by your hand and he'll say access granted because only Jesus can get you into heaven that's all I'm trying to tell you and so it is not it is not richness that caused him to go to hell it is not poorness that caused the other one to go to heaven what I will suggest to you is it is attitude it is the spirit of trust. Who it is that they leaned on. Who it is that they depended upon. The issue with the rich man and the issue that happens oftentimes with those that are rich and wealthy is that they do have a tendency to depend on something other than God, which so happens to be their money. Which is why I'm going to say this, and it's not going to be popular, and you may not say amen, but I'm not a slave to response, so I will say it anyway. Uh, the, the issue with some of us is that we messed around and got blessed beyond what we thought we would ever be blessed with. 
uh, some folk just too blessed for their own good. They just got it going too good. And now since you got it going on, that's what you lean on. That's what you depend on. When you started out and didn't have nothing, you were believing God every day. And now that you got something, you don't need God as much. Well, let me tell you what the truth is. The same God that you had to believe for you to get it is the same God you got to keep believing for you to maintain it. Can I get a witness? The same God that got you the job is the same God you're going to need to help keep you while you on that job. Because every now and then when them crazy looking co-workers walk by you and start saying stuff and rolling their eyes and start plotting and scheming against you, how many of you know you're going to need God on your job to keep you from shooting somebody? You, you're going to need God to keep you from knocking somebody's block off in Jesus' name. And so it is that this is the thing, this is the essence, this is uh, the idea that we have to maintain is who was it that they were looking to? Who were they dependent upon? One dependent upon his riches and the other who although he had not much of anything, watch his attitude. It did not cause him to do something that was crazy, hear this, in the midst of him not having. Because if the man lays at the gate and he is begging daily, but if the man never gives him anything, if he doesn't maintain his integrity, he could decide, you know what? I asked you once. I asked you twice. You keep telling me no on this third time. I'm going to just go and get it myself. Oh, God, I could hang my hat there and tell you that just because people tell you no don't mean you need to go and take it. Oh, yeah. My question to you is, can you handle somebody telling you no? Uh, there has to come a season in your life where you can receive the no of people and access and accept the yes that comes from God. But because he experienced his evil during his life, he was able to experience comfort in the afterlife. Let me say something to every person that's saved and then those that are unsaved. If you are saved, and you're going through trials and tribulations if you're going through the figurative hell in your life right now here's what I want you to be encouraged with the most hell you will ever experience is what you go through on this side but for those that don't know God and enjoying their life and living the good life the most fun you will ever experience will only be in this life and I want to encourage all of us to make sure you do what grandmama and them said and build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. Because how many know that this life is temporary but eternity is eternal? Which means you're going to spend more time where you're going to be when you leave here than you spent while you were down here. And so that's why it's important for us, particularly us is, that we start thinking about something beyond the present. You got to think about your life tomorrow. You got to think about your your life beyond this point because if you become a slave to the immediate you will never embrace the true ultimate that's in essence the story of the rich man and the poor man now I wish that I had told you uh, prior to you coming that uh, there uh, your pastor to Daryl White would not be preaching the whole time I should have told you that he would not be preaching the whole message as a matter of fact uh, I'm getting ready to to uh, take a back seat and I'm going to invite somebody else to finish the rest of this message. So y'all tell Pastor White, see you later because Pastor White is getting ready to take a back seat and I'm going to have somebody else to finish the rest of this message. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite to finish the rest of this message, the rich man. I'm dead. This hell place is real.
It's so dark in here. And it's so hot. I know why. If only I had treated that brother better. All he wanted was crumbs that fell from my table. And I couldn't even do that. I wore the best clothes every day. Purple, fine linen <laughs> had it going on. Nobody could dress fresher than me. I ate what I wanted to eat every day. If I ate bologna, it's because I chose to. If I wanted to put it in the skillet and fry it in the middle and let it curl up like a hand, let it burn on one side and flip it and burn on the other side, I could do that. And I watched a man be hungry every day. And now I'm here. Before you feel too sorry for me, I might end up feeling sorry for you too. Because who is it that you overlooking that you supposed to be assigned to? I was calling him a problem, but he was really my assignment. And instead of helping him out, I looked at him and I laughed at him. And I watched the dogs lick his sores. If only I had been nicer. And now I'm here. And I have an acknowledgement of my condition. It's funny. I never experienced hell on earth. But it's something about being here that you don't have to go through a class to find out that you're here. Nobody had to tell me where I was. When I lift up my eyes, I recognize that's where I am. So sort of, so, sort of like, sort of like some of you, sort of like some of you. But but the difference between me and you is, you go to church. I didn't go to church, but it's it's just like you. You know, you don't want nobody else to know. But in your life, you you going through some hell yourself. You, you catching it, you catching it, you catching it, and you acknowledge it. You don't want nobody else to know, but you acknowledge it. Some of you are in bad relationships, and you know it's hell. Yeah. Ain't nobody got to tell you. you, you know, nobody got to tell you. You know your man trifling. You know it. You, you know you, you dealing with a lazy, immature woman. You already know it. Ain't nobody got to tell you. You, you. you pretend like everything is good on your job, but the truth of the matter is you can't stand it. You got a little prestige. You got a little position. You got a little power, but it's hell for you. You don't want nobody else to know it. That's cool. That's cool in the game. You drive a nice car and all of that, but you cry in it often. You, you, you got a nice house. You got a big house, as a matter of fact, but you spend a whole lot of time in your room by yourself. I understand. It's, it's hell for you, and you know when you're there. That's why I would tell y'all, y'all got to stop down in some of these people that ain't as close to the church as you are because the truth of the matter is they know what they're going through too. That brother that's on the street, he know what he's doing ain't right. That sister that's in that club, she know what she's doing ain't right. And we beat up people and act like they don't know. But when people are in hell, they know it. They acknowledge it. I know where I am. I've never been here before. But the moment I got in here, I recognized that I was in here and something needed to change. The difference between you and me is I can't do nothing about my hell, but you can do something about yours. Sorry, I got to come at you like this and maybe you don't feel my pain. And how could you feel my pain? Because you get to experience your life. You get to do, you still have what I don't have. You have the luxury of time on your side. Or at least you think you do. But I acknowledge, I acknowledge where I am. It's hot. You complaining about a hot car, a hot house, a hot church building. Come here and see how much you appreciate 
I know you look nice, but when you come to hell, it's so dark, you don't know what you got on. Excuse me. If my words get short. There's no air here. And if I talk a little drowsy, it's because I'm sleepy. I was wondering why I'm so tired. It wasn't until I got here that I even cared about scripture. Revelation 14, 11 tells me that hell is a place of no rest. For those of you who like stand up at night, you're going to wish you had that rest. If you come here, I can't feel my feet under me like I'm floating. Because Jesus tried to tell me hell is a bottomless pit. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, that don't work down here. Acknowledge where I, where I am. Y'all, they say it's the second death, but I'm talking to you. How is that? Oh, the worm never dieth. I want to die, but I can't. I got to feel this pain. Scorpions, beasts, so much cussing going on. I can't see, but I can hear the sound of anguish and pain. I acknowledge where I am. Do you? Are you right with God? Or are you just right with your membership? You know church, right? Do you know Jesus? You know parliamentary procedure? You know business? You don't know God's business? It's no fun here and I acknowledge where I am. When I first got down here, I asked Abraham to send that poor brother that I would never help. I wanted him to do me a favor. All them days he was asking me to do a favor. Just give him some food and I wouldn't even do it. I don't know what I was thinking. Why would I expect somebody to help me? I don't never help nobody. I asked him to dip his finger in some water and put it on my tongue because I was hot. I was tormented. Can I tell you what hell taught me? Hell taught me to appreciate common things. Because while I lived, I was drinking the finest wine. <laughs> I would open up a bottle of the best. <laughs> I had my glass. I was sipping champagne, you know, having a good time. Could drink whatever I wanted to drink. <laughs> I could put it on the rocks if I wanted to. I could drink it straight if I wanted to. Coca-Cola, Sprite, Dr. Pepper, Sun Kissed, all of that. I drank whatever I wanted to drink. Strong drink, regular drink. It didn't matter. I drank only the best bottled water. But when I got down here, I didn't even care about no glass. I told him, even though I didn't know where his hands had been, dip your finger in water and put it on my tongue. I'm so angry with y'all. I'm so angry with some of y'all because here you are. You complain so much. You complain about luxuries you don't have. And you got all you need. You complain because you don't have a designer's label to wear. You, you complain because 
Somebody cook some. I don't want that. I don't want to eat that. And down here, you don't have a choice. So go on. Enjoy your mixed drinks. Enjoy your birthday parties. But a day going to come where your desire is going to change. You go through enough hell in your life. That list you made that was so long of everything you wanted God to do. Your relationships. I want them to be tall. I want them to be dark. I want them to be muscular. I want them to be fine. I want them to have a good job. I want them to have good credit. But then when you go through enough bad relationships, you'll get to a place and say, God, give me somebody that loves you and that's somebody that loves me. That, that's good enough for me. Complain about the cars that you drive and this one don't have this one and this one don't have the, the camera option and no sunroof in it and you go through enough bad stuff and bad trips. You just say, God, just give me something dependable. That's all that matters to me. You complain about how much money you ain't got, but down here it don't matter how much you got because you can't bring none of it with you. You'll start appreciating common stuff. Things like inhale and exhale because I'm losing my breath and I'm getting excited down here. But you can breathe easily. You don't even think about it. You just do it. You don't even count your breaths. But I can count mine. Because there's so few and far in between. If I could tell you something from hell, I'd tell you. You better stop complaining about what you ain't got. And start being grateful for what you do have. Because a day can come. But you don't have any of it. Did I forget to tell you? <laughs> My request was denied. You don't even get a tip of water. No restroom break. No water break. No bottle water. No water fountain. I'm so thirsty. I would drink from a colored fountain. It wouldn't matter if it was dirty or if there were bugs around it. I'd appreciate whatever I can get. But I don't have a choice now. I would tell you, stay away from here. As a matter of fact, you know what else I tried to do? I tried to tell Abraham to tell Lazarus to leave from his heavenly state and go back because I got five brothers. I got five brothers and I don't want them to be here because something about being in hell will make you have more attention on Jesus. It'll make you have attention to Christ. It'll make you appreciate him. While I was living, I never talked to my brothers about being saved. But you know what we got down here in hell that y'all don't have in church? We, we care about the lost. <laughs> Some of you, you got five brothers and you don't even invite them to church. <laughs> you came to church and left people at home and you didn't even ask them if they wanted to go with you. <laughs> and so you end up where you going to go and they going to end up coming down here because you weren't even nice enough to invite them to taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> And you call yourself the church and all you care about is what the church going to do for you. And, and when we going to go on a fellowship and when we going to have another picnic and what colors we going to wear for the church anniversary. You need to get real because the truth of the matter is your whole purpose is supposed to be out there trying to win all these folks that you keep dogging out. And you keep saying they ain't no good. And Next time you see somebody coming to church that's got a black and mild behind their ear and their pants sagging instead of you getting mad and talking about it. You need to be thanking God that you got a net to catch somebody like that so that they don't end up down here with me. I got five brothers and nobody could go back and warn them. If anything I could say to you, I tell you, with your nice looking self, with your handsome self, with your beautiful self, it don't matter if you come down here because whatever color you were when you came, you're going to be burnt when you get here. <laughs> you bring your money with you if you want to <laughs> ain't nothing in hell you want <laughs> so you wouldn't even buy anything down here 
<laughs> yeah, your degrees don't matter because guess what? Your PhD don't make you smart enough to escape. I bet you can't find no exit doors. Uh -huh. Yeah, bring your Rolls Royce, bring your Benz. You can't drive because your car, it will be set on fire anyway. So you can't do anything with it while you're down here. So go on, live it up, enjoy your life, and forget about the fact that one day you got to leave. You know what I thought? I thought I was going to live forever with all my money and with all my money and all my prestige and all my credentials. I thought I would live forever. I thought I was better off than Lazarus because I was rich and he was poor. But you know what? Rich folk and poor people have the same end. They both die. I thought he could die and I couldn't. But the truth is, we both die. Everybody dies. And unless Jesus the, 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 the delays or denies his coming within the next few weeks or the next few months or the next few years, it's a whole lot more people going to end up coming down here. And I'm trying to tell you, now that I have a heart, what I would tell my brothers, don't come to this place. Don't come here. Whatever you do, don't come here. Get it right. Whatever it is, get it right. Don't come here. Life is too short for you to be being petty. Don't come here. Life is too short for you to walk around being mad at people over stuff that in five years you're going to forget about why you was mad about it anyway. Don't come here. Don't just put on the church face. Don't just put on a pseudo personality. Actually love people. All of this talking about people behind that back stuff. That stuff is played. Don't do that. Stop dogging out people. As a matter of fact, maybe you can't hear me. Maybe this is just a figment of your imagination because the truth is there's a great gulf fixed. I really can't come to you and you really can't come to me. So if I could say something that you would hear that since nobody can come from hell really and tell you about their experience and tell you really not to come here, you're going to have to listen to them preachers. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret about them preachers. It's some down here. I'm going to tell you a secret about these preachers. I'm going to tell you a secret. All of them ain't right. But can I tell you the bigger secret? What they say is right. And even if you don't like them, it's still the word that they're preaching. And God is not going to hold you accountable for whether or not you like them. He's going to hold you accountable for whether or not you listen to them. So you go ahead and keep going to sleep in church. You go ahead and keep staying up all night on Saturday and then get to church and finally want to doze off. Go on and keep missing the word. But when you end up here, you're going to find out you can't sleep if you want it to. You keep on being mean to people that need you. You keep on overlooking people talking about I got mine. Now you better get yours. The only reason God gave you yours is so you can help somebody get theirs. That's the only reason you blessed to be a blessing. And if you're going to be blessed and not be a blessing, you might as well get rid of all your blessings. What sense is it for God to give you all that money and you won't even sow nothing? You won't help nobody. You won't give towards no call. You won't help some poor people eat a meal. And that was me. Overlooked my assignment because I was focused more on what I could get and what I could gain and the life that was afforded to me. This big house, this big mansion on the hill. You know, at my funeral, you know what I wanted when they buried me? I wanted a U Haul. But I found out they don't take U Hauls to cemeteries. All that money I have. I wanted it to come with me. So you know what my friends did? They wrote me a check. But I couldn't cash it. And even if I could cash it, what in hell do you want? But if you die and go to heaven... You won't need the money because everything there is free anyway. So if I could close before I turn it back over to your pastor, I would tell you what I wish somebody would tell my brothers. 
don't come here. It's not worth it. Love everybody you see. Give your life for the sake of other people. But most of all, if you never accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, do that today. Because I'm a witness. You ain't got to do everything right. But you need to do one right thing. And that's give your heart and your soul to Jesus. I don't get this privilege to talk to you long. Because now I have to finish the rest of my eternity to a minute. But you don't have to. Maybe we can't hear from hell. But maybe you should hear this preacher today. Ain't nothing wrong with enjoying your life. But there's an eternal life that's more important than this one. Enjoy it. Stand in line and get Jordans when they come out and wait hours. Hey, spend all your hard-earned money buying some Jordans and being broke. Enjoy. That's your choice. You can do that. That's cool. Spend more hours doing homework, reading your science and social studies book, and not stay in the Bible. That's your choice. Parents, encourage your children's education more than their salvation. Enjoy. Send them to school without telling them to make sure that they find a church when they're out there. Go ahead. Enjoy. That's fine. Make it do what you do. Make it do what it do. Hey, it's your world. Hey. But if I were you, I wouldn't gamble with this hell thing. I would rather die trying to live the best I could and find out that there is no heaven and there is no hell. I would rather do that than to live my life believing that there is no hell only to find out If you are not saved, meaning if you have not given your life to Jesus, I didn't come here to shout you because I found out people can shout and still not know Jesus. I didn't come here to move you or to entertain you or to be politically correct. I can care less. I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher. I'm not interested in being popular. It don't make me no difference. As a matter of fact, I like the cool, laid back, sitting on the front porch, eating watermelon life. I don't like big stages. I'll do it if my assignment calls for it. Only when my assignment calls for it. But I'm just cool to tell you, don't make anything bigger than your God relationship. Nothing. Not even your kids. Not even your spouse. Not even your relationships. If I could just find me somebody, if you could just find Jesus, then finding somebody won't consume your heart. If we could just find Jesus, we wouldn't have to hear about people killing each other every time we turn on the news. Guns don't kill people. It's people with guns. 
Hatred kills people. Hatred causes people to steal from one another. Hatred causes people to harm people with their words. I'm assigning to you today as a preacher is to warn you don't go to that place. That's my word for you. You ain't no some big. You ain't no some extra. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe my vocabulary ain't deep enough. But anybody that's checking this out via Facebook, via YouTube, maybe you like church. You like watching preachers on YouTube. You, you, you like putting comments down in the section. Are you saved? Why are you trying to critique a sermon? Are you saved? Preacher. If I preached that sermon, I would have said it this way. Bump how you would have said it. Are you saved? Choir member, I know you can sing, but are you saved? How you treat your brothers and sisters? Don't go to that place. When you get home, do yourself a favor. Do your family a favor. Send your brothers and sisters that don't go to church a text message or send them a call. Make sure you let them know. Today is the day of salvation. How bad would it be for your family to die and come to you in a dream and say, why you didn't tell me about this place? We hung out. We went to the mall. I came over your house. We watched the Super Bowl together. You went to church every Sunday. Why you ain't tell me about this place? Shame on us. I refuse to die and my whole family not hear me say, there's a heaven and there's a hell and you must choose ye this day whom you gonna serve. Listen, I want to extend an invitation to you that even if you're already saved, you've given your life to Jesus Christ, but you know your life is not living up to the God standard he's called you to. My prayer for you today is not salvation. You got that. My prayer is sanctification. We got to live better. We got to live better. Somebody say amen to the truth. We got to live better. We got to live better. I ain't living bad. You put your job before church. We got to live better. We got to live better. You content with the word one day a week. No, we got to do better. The only time you pray is when you hear me do it on Monday morning. No, we got to do better. If the only time you read your scriptures when you see it on this screen, we got to do better. If the only people you like are people that you like, or the only people you love are people that you like, we got to do better. Your enemies got to be loved by you too. If you only pray for people that you like, it's time for us to do some growing because you got to pray for your enemies. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for every ear that heard this word that we will understand how important this is our lives depend on the decision to make you our choice and we choose to love you today not out of fear of hell but we choose to love you today because you first loved us and something about being with you one time makes us want to be with you all the time. Every day with you is sweeter than the day before. And for those that don't know that, I pray God that as they have heard this word, that they will receive you into their heart, make you their Lord and their Savior, and their lives shall never be the same. God, we stand in agreement with every unsaved person, for every unsaved person.
that is making a cry for help and they don't even know what they're crying out to or what they're crying out for but we know they're crying out for you give them a revelation of your presence give them a revelation of your finished works on Calvary that they will say what must I do to be saved and I give you praise in advance that our communities are not changing because money is coming into them our communities are not changing because of the houses that will be built our communities are going to change heart by heart life by life and I give you praise in advance for the salvation of our families for brothers, for sisters, for children, for grandchildren, for nieces, for nephews, for aunts, for uncles. Salvation in our home begins today. In Jesus' name.